Okay, good morning. How are you doing? How are you doing, Darren? Yeah, no, I'm not too bad, thank you, Tim. Sunny day, it's a Friday. Um, and uh, yeah, you not too much to complain about. A long weekend ahead for those of us uh, in the UK as well. So, uh, of course, yeah, lovely, so lovely. Always right with the world, yeah. Yeah, well, you say that. <laughs> <laughs> except for. Yeah, except, well, except for plenty of things. But, um, but yeah, I mean, China, China again has, uh, has caught my eye overnight for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the, the industrial profits weren't great. Um, they're, they're all slowing. The, the companies are struggling to make money, obviously, on the back of a, a sort of a not, a not fully recovering economy. You know, the, the exports, the increase in commodity costs, everything's sort of working against them. And, and I noticed that you shared in the uh, Discord earlier as well, the uh, Ed Yardeni uh, piece there that shows that actual retail sales growth has been declining for the last 10 years. Yeah. You, uh, yeah. I mean, that's it's, it's amazing. He's it's got a very different different way of looking at the world uh, mm. and he's, he's one of those sort of contrarian voices that I always like to not not that he's often that much of a contrarian to me but he's certainly an outlier to a lot of other people and mm. um, and, it, and it's always very interesting to have to to hear somebody else's take China data of course is uh, notoriously uh, unreliable so yes. uh, it, it's interesting to see somebody take a you know a very dispassionate view in smooth smooth day throughout and, and come up with a reading like that so uh, yeah um, Actually, I'm not too surprised. I suppose um, if you know if you've got an aging population, they are you know probably inclined to spend less. I, I don't. I've no idea what uh, social security is like in uh, in China, but I imagine it's re- a relatively frugal environment. So um, yeah. So you, you'd assume that perhaps over time, uh, spending would drop. Perhaps perhaps not by quite such a large margin as that chart indicates. Though, so um, it'd be interesting to see how that one pans out. But they're not going to. You're not. Not you're going to see. Um, you know that that sort of reflected day to day, but over the you know a couple of years, maybe we'll, we'll we'll start to pick that up in other data. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I think I think they're actually. I mean, with all of these new policy things that we're seeing, these new policy me- measures, we're seeing them starting to respond already. Um, you know, I've noticed that they're actually um, uh, what they're doing as well is they're cutting back on the influences. I don't know if you sort of spotted that that news this morning. It's been it's been coming anyway. That, you know, it's very much telegraphed. But they're cutting down on the sort of celebrity groups that are sort of, you know, they're yeah, using but- for influencing, they're cutting down on the big data for the tech firms that are trying to incentivize people to, to buy this and do that. Um, you know, and obviously they, they are now looking to, well, I say looking to, they're talking about cutting rates to the rural areas as well, specifically, you know, tar- targeted rate cuts as well. So I think there's, yeah, uh, I think there's an awful lot going on there. And they, uh, I worry that they're trying to change too much too fast. Uh, yeah, I think they probably are. I think there's probably still a lot of hangovers of uh, uh, from the from the old Maoist c- command economy, and the, and the idea that uh, f- you know there's still this idea of five or ten year plans from the centre can uh, can fix everything. Um, mm. uh, and we we touched on this last time I was on that you know it's it's very difficult to read uh, exactly what uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, want to do what, where they where they are and what they think they can achieve. What I would say is if, if people have got access to uh, the iPlayer and BBC Two, there's a very interesting documentary on this week called uh, China's Magic Weapon about okay, uh, about about uh, an organisation called the United Work Front, uh, which is is basically a, a front for the Communist Party and how it tries to influence. Uh, Chinese expats abroad and for and um, the uh, the countries that they live in. It's actually very sinister stuff. So uh, okay. sorry to say, sorry to say. So I think everybody should should watch that if they can. Um, uh, and it gives you just a bit of a maybe an insight into the into the into the mindset of the leadership in Beijing. Uh, yeah, and what they're, absolutely. They're prepared to do to um, uh, to get to where they want to go. Yeah, there's uh, there's always the thing with those uh, any of those sort of documentaries that I that I tend to uh, I kind of caution on though is that it it, it it tends to show one little perspective, but you don't actually get to see necessarily how successful all of these measures are. It just gives you a little piece of the picture. I think there oh, was one oh. there was one a little while ago as well that showed it was a I think it was like a, a US uh, hedge fund I think it was or something like that, and they were actually they went to China to check you know what the companies were doing behind the scenes based on all these um all these investment vehicles that were listed in the us and, and the caymans and so on 
and they were actually going and checking on, on what the companies were saying and they were like expecting these massive factories that were showing out all this stuff and they found one guy in a car you know <laughs> this sort of stuff it was a really good one i find that as well it just gives you a little yeah. picture you know of the all you know things to be aware of that all isn't as it seems necessarily no, no absolutely not well i mean I, I can't remember the name of the guy but the the uh, chinese former chinese vice premier uh, he came up didn't he with a series of measures to try and uh, and try, try to sort of measure what's going on in the Chinese economy day to day on the ground. This is what happens when you get old, Tim. Your your memory becomes selective. Um, but uh, it, it, <laughs> you know this this is a group of things that includes like electricity production and that kind of thing and uh, um, uh, freight freight statistics and and that kind of stuff just to get a handle on uh, the real Chinese economy rather than uh, you know the official figures of so many state-run enterprises. But uh, anyway, yeah, let's uh, let's move on because we we're pressed for time. So you um, yeah, I mean. Wow. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to talk about Jackson Hole um, today. Oh. Not that I think anything much is going to happen, but it's uh, it's bound to, you know, when you've got that many Fed speakers all coming on, at, you know, at roughly the same time, should we say, in the same trading session. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've got to pay attention. You know, I mean, I, I think it's to me, you know, tell, tell me if you uh, if you agree or not with this. But to me, I think the whole the whole sort of uh, hype around the taper is is misguided i i really don't think that now i think they have telegraphed it and done exactly what they said they were going to do they telegraphed it so well that um that no one really cares about it i i think that really now as i mentioned earlier what we, what we need to be looking for is the comments on equality full employment and whether or not the taper will immediately lead to rate hikes or anything else which i think that they'll come straight out and say it will actually allow, you know, tapering now allows them to be more more flexible and patient on the uh, on the ranks further down the road. So yeah. uh, that's that's really really my thinking. What, what do you reckon? I don't disagree entirely. I've just put um, something in the chat there, which is a, a look quite useful look back on what happened in 2013. Um, yeah. Just to refresh people's memories, Ben Bernanke was appearing. This is. Uh, what, eight years ago, Ben Bernanke was appearing at, in front of Congress in May 2013 when he first mentioned the idea of of the Fed tapering their uh, uh, their QE program. That at that stage, that spooked the markets, and I think I'm right in saying that the S and P then fell five percent in well, collectively in five days. But the interesting thing is that though they mentioned um, tapering in May, they didn't actually pull the trigger uh, until December of that year, mm. and by that stage. Uh, the total return on the S&P was something north of 30%. Um, and the market, you know, it, it, it basically by the end of June, it shrugged off any concerns of, of tapering and motored on. So um, we, we've got a more condensed um, uh, time scale here because, you know, if he speaks about it today, you know, the likelihood is that actually in November now, according to Goldman. So we're really talking about uh, two, three months at best. Um, mm -hmm. But as I say, I think, I think you're right. I, uh, I think, uh, you know, the, it's been diffused slightly the the shock value of, of, of talk of taper now as you say it's been it's been well uh highlighted in advance uh and, and the market shouldn't really be that surprised plus um it, for, for stocks anyway there's so many uh you know positives earnings season again was uh, an absolute knockout uh and uh you know the, the, the market's got to learn to stand in its own two feet and the vast majority uh, of, of stocks are certainly the majors have, have, have performed well um we come we will come back to the idea of uh, the, you know the concept of zombie companies i'm sure at a later stage but e even for them if interest rates stay stay low for the foreseeable future and i, and I think that's quite likely too yeah then there's you know there's, there's more of a transition than a sharp change i think is what i'm trying to say really yeah, I'd agree with that for sure. I'd agree with that for sure. I really wouldn't be surprised to see, though, in this in this coming period now, a bit of uh, a, a still, regardless, a bit of a sell off, almost like, uh, you know, that it will be the whole the whole narrative of, you know, the markets can't live without QE and they can't this and they can't that. But it actually might be quite healthy um, to see some of the leaders take a take a break. You know, maybe yeah, uh, yeah. maybe sort of moving. You you flagged the energy stocks as one in particular, haven't you? As a sector, in yeah, particular, I have, looking yeah. quite undervalued. Yeah. You know, maybe yes. we'll see a bit of a rotation and a bit more breadth in the market overall again. Yeah, that that would be good if we get that. And I mean, you know, the the old market adage is always to to buy the rumor, sell the fact. So we could say it's better mm. to travel than to arrive. So so when you're coming up to a big event, there's often, uh, you know, uh, as you say, a sell off uh, once once the story's actually out there. So we might well see that. Plus, we're coming up to the end of the month. You know, 
etc etc it's not to, it's not as if there's much incentive to uh, to get extra long um, over the coming days no very true i mean and this is the the other thing as well that i noticed earlier something we spoke about with the um uh with the supply chains and the chip shortages um it's it's actually sort of based around toyota um i don't know if you spotted the uh this one but it came again came through asia asia session um it's the main one of the main suppliers to toyota ford and honda um is basically saying that they they've been running at full capacity since september last year um but they're overwhelmed by customer orders and they don't think they'll be able to fulfill them uh fulfill the backlog of orders in the coming year so they're basically saying that this chip crunch is going to last until the end of next year um yeah, based on their current projections it doesn't surprise me to me and i think that's probably the case across a lot of industries but what well, you know there was a knee-jerk reaction on lockdown people cancelled orders um and because you know we, we talked about this in the past so just in terms of supply chains uh, run run to be hyper efficient so people cancelled orders the manufacturers you know lay staff off multiple factories etc uh the, the logistics people do similar and then suddenly we're, we're all back on again yeah. um and 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 you know you, you can't just look well they're, they're finding now you can't just turn that on i mean some people have, have gone away not coming back to work um some businesses have, have, have closed up and, where, and everywhere there are link there are holes or just or just kinks in the supply chain is creates a you know a knock-on effect even you know shipping is, is obviously the, the one that gets the most uh the, the the most publicity but mm. but there's so many other links you know lorry drivers here in the uk but you'd have to think that that in re, in reality that situation is probably uh you know true in true in um in other areas too people that drove lorries are now working in other industries maybe they've gone to work for amazon doing deliveries in another way or, or similar or yeah. you know or just or found something else completely different to do and they can't replace that those uh skilled staff at the drop of a hat so uh yeah um it's 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 dislocated the economy and 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 the and the supply chain i think is probably the best way to think about covid it probably much like um it's a, probably not the best taste of the analogy but much like somebody who's got long covid you know they they yeah. might be over the disease it well mm. the, the chance of dying's maybe gone away but the but their body's still struggling to recover uh from uh, from the effects and i think that's exactly the way to look at the uh at the economy and the supply chain in particular and I, said, I think i said this last time out but perhaps we'll pay a bit more attention now you know to just how fragile just in time supply chains are i mean it may, maybe it doesn't make too much odds if we can't or buy can't get a luxury car for six months i mean it, it's going to have a knock-on effect but what if the food chain uh, yeah you know supply chain were, were that vulnerable maybe it is we don't know well, but it uh, you know that would be it would be i mean we've heard talk of problems with meat people packing meat did i see a headline the other day um that the prisoners were going to be encouraged to go and work in meat packing yes. factories to try and make up a shortfall it's lud- a ludicrous idea yeah, Good idea. there's a, a load of people that the violent criminal was out in, into an environment with knives but anyway <laughs> it's just it just shows you um you know what, what the the potential pitfalls of, of our modern day society and and how a black swan event can uh, can turn things on their head yeah i mean i i very much have, i've been of the opinion of this since the whole pandemic came is that out of these kind of disruptions you actually get more efficiency and the uh, a lot of the shipping and everything else was uh, was run on very old technology systems and um, you know it still is relatively speaking it was it was very much sort of archaic you know people were still making orders you know placing orders for their shipping sort of space by phone maybe by a text message or by you know, an email or something like that when really you know the infrastructure is exists and the technology exists that you could centralize an awful lot of stuff and just have people booking slots remotely for when they needed it and you know you could just have someone waiting almost you can have it in a queue if they're waiting for a slot you just bump them into another one if they're going to be ready there's so many ways that it can be more efficient and i think yet that's going to be the big big thing that's going to come out of it is actually the data-driven supply chain that's going to be a lot more efficient um overall in a, yeah. in a more a more robust efficiency you know rather than a uh, a just-in-time kind of optimized I, efficiency I, I think you're i think you're right and if one industry were, were you were to pick an industry would be capable of making that transition it would be the transport and logistics because they already do some incredible work yeah um, you know the, you know they're very much the uh you know the the uh, the end product is the swan um 
mm-hmm. serenely gliding across the lake and underneath is the you know the frantic kicking of the logistics industry which we, ne- we never see never no. really think about a- 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 until it breaks down so uh, very true so yeah there we are so yes, yeah, so really, it's just the thing to keep an eye on there is to see if it starts to um, to impact any uh, any profitability. That's the main the main thing is that if basically production is hampered uh, further, you know, then, then it, does I, it continue to impact companies' ability to make money? I think it must inevitably, but maybe maybe it's selectively. Um, mm-hmm. and of course, you know, in the, there's also the flip side that it's actually been beneficial to those, you know, the shipping lines have all made a lot of money. I I dare say that the, uh, the sort of intermodal logistics, as they call it, the people that move goods from ports by, via rail and lorry and other forms of transport uh, uh, are doing very nicely as well too. I haven't dug too deeply into that, but you'd have to think that was the case. But yes, at some point, um, it, it must buy into uh, the, the efficiency and the, the profitability of, uh, of, of the end users. Um, and perhaps we'll see that in this, you know, the next three months of the run up to Christmas, etc etc we you know they can't underplay how important the holiday season is to retailers um you know and just to, to sort of take an extension of that personal consumption inflation is still 70 percent of the u.s economy yep. and if there aren't enough things to buy at, for, at christmas then you know that will inevitably leave a dent in the you know the bank balances of companies and and the u.s economy as a whole and not just the u.s of course everywhere else as well but uh, we'll just use them yeah. as a as uh, as an example so yeah knock-on effects uh and we uh, and that you know they may not become apparent until uh you know key one earnings uh next year yeah by well, sort of coming into easter by the time they're going out yeah absolutely yeah fantastic okay mate anything else that's caught your eye at all or should we uh uh well just one thing i don't know if everybody looked at um the 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 stock uh, lordstown motors yesterday uh, i think it's ride our ide the, the ticket they they, yeah. they appointed a new uh, chief executive and at one point the share price was at 40 percent it just you know I, I, one per it's great to have a uh, you know an, a, somebody who knows what they're doing in the driving seat but can one man really make that much of a difference to a company just shows you how 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 these things are priced on sentiment, how they they trade completely irrationally. And you know very well that if things did take a, um, a turn for the worst post comments this afternoon, that's the kind of stock that's going to get hammered hard. Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure, definitely. That's one, one to keep an eye on, perhaps, then. Yeah, well, that, that you know, anything that's just full of sentiment and not... Um, uh, and not um, uh, and they're not really delivering. And then yesterday, I, I just I was looking at some of the insider trading. As I mean, you know, I posted a bit on Walmart, but one mm-hmm. uh, one stock that had escaped me, and uh, and the trade that you know that, that's a big tick in the box for for Dan Loeb, um, US hedge fund manager. He sold a chunk of uh, a thing called Upstart UPST, but mm-hmm. they floated I think in December. They're up ten times since then. The the IPO was uh, was sort of dismissed almost by wall street um it, it's just gone fantastically well and he you know dan Loeb's still sitting on 12 and a half million shares of the stock i don't know what where he got in pre-ipo but uh, he's certainly made some massive money there uh, and uh, that's just one that's at least as far as i'm concerned it's gone under the radar and done very very nicely indeed yeah i've got to be honest I'd, I'd heard the name but i haven't really heard anything about the performance at all which is a surprise for something like that you'd expect it to be everywhere yeah, you would, but they've obviously kept it pretty low key. But uh, yeah, one, one maybe to to uh, to keep on, and it also says maybe maybe a good idea to watch what Dan Loeb's doing as well a bit more closely. For sure, for sure, brilliant. Okay, the moment, well, nice one. Thank you very much for coming on. That's a pleasure. And uh, yeah, well, let's see uh, see what the rest of the day has uh, has for us ahead of the weekend. Lovely. We'll speak later. Yeah. Take care. Brilliant. You too, mate. Bye. Bye. Bye.